Buju Anin, Bungi Etago Ninita Ojibwem, Margaret Hiddle Nindijinikaz, Anishinabe Ndao, Gawin Nin Nindode Mesi, Lakudare Nin Nindunjaba, University of Nebraska Nindanoki. Hello, my name is Margaret Hiddle. Um, I am uh, the descendant of Lakudare Ojibwe or Anishinaabe. Um, I'm also the descendant of European settlers and Assyrian refugees who escaped the Armenian Genocide. So my research focuses on Anishinaabe history, um, looking at the 19th and 20th centuries, which is a time period in Native American history that people usually think of as the low point of Native history, the dark days of Native history, a time of destruction, dispossession, um, loss. And while it was a very destructive uh, time in Native history full of land loss and children being taken away to boarding schools, there's also this narrative of survival, um, thriving and surviving, not just surviving, um, that goes, that, that, um, that speaks to the ongoing strength of Ojibwe sovereignty and Native sovereignty more generally. Um, we were raised uh, with an understanding of what it meant to be Ojibwe. And so um, the story of the persistence of Ojibwe identity in my own family, despite the federal government's attempts to erase Ojibwe people, um, really showed me that the kind of history that you get in um, most history classes and history textbooks in the popular media just isn't true. Native people survived, Native people continue to exist, and they exist as sovereign nations. Um, so my project specifically looks at how Ojibwe sovereignty persisted over time, um, and instead of looking at sovereignty from a Western legal perspective, I try to use use a perspective that the Ojibwe people themselves would understand. So I define sovereignty as um, a series of relationships with land, language, sacred history, kinship, and ceremony. Um, and I look at the ways that these relationships carried Ojibwe sovereignty forward throughout the 19th and 20th century, specifically focusing on how treaties became a vehicle of Ojibwe sovereignty that protected and um, promoted Ojibwe rights um, and relationships with their land and um, you know the resources within the land through the 1950s. So I've been lucky to teach a lot of Native history-centered classes with a lot of enthusiastic students who are really interested in learning about Native history beyond, you know, the standard narrative that they've grown up with. Um, I teach uh, Introduction to Native Studies, and I teach that class almost entirely using Native sources and Native voices, um, which is something I try to do in my teaching to center Native voices. Um, and I teach a version of Native American history, um, where I do the same thing. Most of the sources used in that class are from Native perspectives. In the Introduction to Native Studies class uh, the previous semester, um, we did a local learning project where um, we learned about the indigenous history of Lincoln itself. So from time immemorial to the present day, um, where you know, what is the indigenous story of Lincoln? Where are the indigenous places? What's important to indigenous people? What has been the presence of indigenous people on campus? Um, and then we created a, a website with a map and, a, um, and information about um, the different places in Lincoln where there's this really rich native history that a lot of people don't know much about. Um, I also teach um, the, I teach a class called the Mythic West, um, where, you know, it, on the surface it sounds like we're gonna watch a lot of Westerns, and we do, um, but we look at the, the myths um, that create our idea of the American West, and look at how that, um, that relates 
to the real history of the West. Um, and, you know, we, we look at everything from Mark Twain to the searchers to Westworld today and the evolution of that myth and also the stories that um, marginalized groups in the West, Native Americans, um, Mexican Americans, Chinese Americans are also telling about themselves and how the West really tells a story about American history and how we see ourselves as Americans. Um, and then I also teach U.S. history, and my U.S. history um, classes are influenced by my perspective as someone when I was a student, um, my stories, I didn't hear my family's stories in a traditional U.S. history classroom. The things that I knew um, weren't weren't there. The voices that I wanted to hear weren't there. Um, and so I try to teach U.S. history from as many perspectives as possible, paying attention, you know, to the students who are in, in the classroom um, and trying to make sure that as many perspectives as possible are included in teaching and understanding U.S. history.